As you know, EBRD, the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development, is a newcomer indeed. We now operate in four countries, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Jordan and Egypt. And uh, in the little time that we have, uh, we have had uh, with the support of, of, of the clients, uh, private sector and governments, we have built up already a portfolio of 1.2 billion. So we keep coming and, 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 and learning and this is a wonderful opportunity um, for us to be here. I'd like to start with picking up on where our Chair uh, Minister Ayed um, left off. He said he had a dream that he would be part of a unified country, a unified region. Maybe I can take a personal road, uh, note that being a Hungarian and coming from an ex-communist country, uh, we didn't even dare to dream back in the 70s when I started to, to have some self-recognition uh, or the 80s that we would be ever uh, outside a communist uh, empire and part of the European Union. But here we are, so dreams do come true. Um, and I'd like to present to you how it has worked out in, in emerging uh, Europe. Um, and the main message is that it can work with a very strong magnet, of course, with the EU that we have had uh, admitted, which of course, as, as we have just heard, also went through its own uh, uh, durations and, 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 and cycles. Um, but it can, it, can, it can really work. It, however, has had certain problems. So when there is, and that will be one of my main points here, that economic integration is really has to be done extremely carefully, even if it can be done fast, but very carefully, uh, looking at the regulatory environment in particular, otherwise it can have um, also relatively high cost. So that's our story. I'd like to invite you, if you could, to take uh, to the uh, slide that uh, we have distributed. I am indulging you, um, please, only because some of the graphs are really very telling. So it's much easier for me to, to explain the story if I can draw your attention to them. So uh, look at the, the one uh, with the, which, well it's a four graph, so that would be uh, on the um, uh, bottom corner left, which really sums up very nicely, I think, the Central uh, European Market Economic Model. It has been a model of very rapid convergence until uh, the global financial crisis, and then a major readjustment um, to that model. Um, uh, since how, how it worked before the crisis, if you take um, the lines, the upper line, uh, you don't have the color, but it is higher, and the very steeply increasing uh, line is is the share of investment in GDP starting from 2000, and as you see, it, it rapidly grew, while the lower line, national savings, uh, did not keep space. So savings basically stayed uh, unchanged. So the quick rise in investment that really underlied and financed economic transformation uh, in emerging Europe was financed by foreign savings. So that was the main source. This was not domestic savings that stayed you know, reasonably constant, but it was foreign savings, and particularly FDI. And that was really the European magnet. It was a top-down integration of uh, harmonization of institutions, legal frameworks, and a bottom-up financial, very, exact, uh, very quick financial sector integration as well as trade integration, as the two had a very nice uh, positive dynamics. Um, and as the next uh, chart shows, particularly on the financial sector, very, very in intense, uh, um, uh, high-density, cross-border integration in terms of equity. So what you see, you would see here, is all going one way. It's from Western Europe, money as well as ownership taking over emerging Europe, uh, Europe's banks. So by the time uh, of early 2000s, Basically, most of the banking sectors um, in emerging Europe uh, were already owned by Austrian, Italian, Greek, um, uh, French, Ger Bel uh, Belgian, some German uh, uh, banks. So that was a massive, very rapid integration which financed 
investment, also consumption, and it really has worked. So there is some econometric analysis, but in this, uh, the bottom line of that uh, uh, on the chart is that the model really has worked for growth. If you look at emerging Europe, uh, and this is this little graph shows you in the next uh, page, uh, top uh, left corner. Um, in the transition countries, which is the right hand chart, the higher the current account deficit was, the, the higher the growth was for a, for a long period of time. So it's a good sample. Um, in non-transition European countries, which is the left chart, this is the opposite the case, and it's the usual uh, uh, you know, paradox of emerging markets, as many of, of us sort of um, live with, is that the higher the uh, or lower the um, uh, current account deficit or higher the current account surplus, higher the growth is. So really, foreign savings is not financing growth. That has not been the case in emerging Europe. So the model really has worked. Very rapid integration. However, came the global financial crisis, as, and as on the first chart you could see, there was a collapse in investment, collapse in finance, Domestic savings started to edge up as part of the adjustment process. Uh, the big difference closed up, so current account deficits uh, disappeared. But no foreign financing. And the whole integration model, emerging Europe also has been massively, massively tested. There has been a huge deleveraging of parent banks um, from, uh, from emerging Europe. Not that much capital they stayed in, mainly or mostly, but more in liquidity. So a massive withdrawal of, of capital, and there is a chart uh, actually um, from BIS data and, and IMF colleagues, which showed that the whole region lost 10 percentage point of GDP between 2008 and, and 2014, most recent data. That is a lot of money. So deleveraging really, really hit hit um, hit, uh, hit this um, this region. That was the vulnerability that came about with a very strong integration. Um, just one more point. The bulk of deleveraging, two-thirds, actually happened in, uh, when the Eurozone crisis hit, when the parent banks got into trouble. So when the parent banks were still holding up 2008-2009, uh, actually the deleveraging was not very strong and we supported that with a special coordination framework uh, for, for, uh, between home and host country regulators. Now, so the model has been tested. It still holds very nicely for growth. So foreign savings financing uh, growth, but foreign savings is no longer there in the quantity that we used to have. So there has to be, has to be a rebalancing. And indeed, there has been quite a lot of rebalancing of the, of the economic model, much more um, reliance on local currency funding than in the, in the past uh, uh, on uh, parent bank funded uh, FX uh, um, uh, resources. And, and this is another uh, an additional point, there's a rebalancing in terms of ownership. Because it's been phenomenally good to have the foreign banks. They brought in capital, they brought in know-how. Very important, and this is how growth again was financed. But there has been a certain political economy resentment to having all banks owned by foreigners. And this takes back to, to Gamma's, uh, uh, Ahmed, sorry, uh, Ahmed Gamma's very good point, is that the political economy unfortunately matters. And sometimes it trumps economic efficiency and, and economic desires and, and, and thinking. So in quite a few countries, particularly Hungary, my own country, but also in others, there has been um, a call for more domestication of the banking sector, reducing the, uh, the share of foreigners. Um, not only the banks, actually, in other sectors, telecommunication, energy, under the Logan energy security. So there, is, there are, of course, always uh, justifications for anti-foreign sentiment. My point here is that, that financial integration is extremely good. Again, it has worked beautifully. But political economy considerations really have to be taken also into account when, when you go with that. Um, and, and that calls for a balanced model, both for funding, 
but not only funding, also for ownership and, and, and have the local skin in the game, if you wish, um, in, in all these sectors. An additional um, uh, uh, lesson, if I may, um, um, uh, from, from, uh, from this very rapid integration is that the regulatory framework, particularly in the financial sector, during the boom time, did not keep in pace with the very rapid micro-integration. So there was basically very limited coordination with the host countries, Poland, Hungary and others, central banks and regulators, and the home countries, Austria and others. There were zillions of MOUs, of course, I mean, you know, central bankers around the, the, uh, the table will, will recognize that. A lot of memorandum of understanding what to do. When, when the crisis hit, nobody knew what to do and how to coordinate. We had to f invent very ad hoc uh, coordination mechanisms such as uh, the Vienna Initiative where we put together home and host regulators and banks and, uh, to, to manage, manage the crisis. Now, why I'm saying that? Because actually the banking union is, to our mind, is really the answer here. If it works, it really ups the game in the regulatory system very close, still very closely integrated um, uh, uh, financial sector is now being matched by hopefully a supranational effective regulator as well. So for us, looking from, from emerging Europe, the banking union is a game changer, not only for the Eurozone, but potentially also for whole of Europe. So it's a pan-European game changer. Of course, the, uh, the, the situation is not that easy um, uh, because the banking union to start with is only for the Eurozone, uh, mandatory. We have some members, uh, Slovenia, Slovakia and the Baltics, who will be automatically members. But then we have um, relatively big Euro, uh, uh, EU members uh, who are not Eurozone members. And, um, and, and who have the uh, opportunity to opt in or not opt in into the, into the banking union, the SSM. Now, um, not going into too much detail, I think from our perspective, and we've been working very closely with many of these countries, it would be really important to have the conditions right for these countries who are not automatically um, 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 in the SSM, uh, the single supervisory me mechanism that they also opt in. Um, hopefully this will, this will uh, happen uh, uh, soon enough. We think that ECB um, uh, institution, which, which has shown a, a lot of um, um, uh, wonderful uh, leadership in, in, in recent years particularly, uh, may give further consideration of of, of having more sweeteners, particularly in the form of currency swaps, which would give some assurance for non-Eurozone member countries um, uh, for liquidity management should they opt in, into the banking union. There's also a group of countries, uh, the southern European countries, um, the likes of Serbia, uh, Albania and the like, there are uh, five, six of them, which don't have the opportunity of, of, of opting in into the, into the banking union because they are not EU members, but all their banking sectors still are owned by Eurozone-based banks. So there is potentially a huge regulatory gap uh, between these host countries, the banks, you know, the Austrian, Italian, etc., uh, uh, Greek banks, um, so the host country supervisors really don't have a, a coordination mechanism with the new supervisor um, uh, to be the ECB. So there, there is something that requires um, some policy um, attention. Now what it all means for the summit countries, the, uh, the southern Eastern European countries, because that's what's interesting. Let me direct your attention back uh, to the charts, one of the charts, because the same investment uh, 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 savings balance we, we put together for our four uh, countries, uh, Jordan, Egypt, um, Tunisia and Morocco. So that is on page three, um, lower uh, left corner. And what it shows in the aggregate, of course countries differ, but in the aggregate, is that before the crisis actually um, these countries more or less um, finance their own investment. So domestic savings, more or less, that is variation, 
financed their own investment. Yet there was foreign capital inflow, and what it was used to is to build up reserves and really strengthen the monetary framework and the credibility. So it was very wisely used. But foreign savings at the aggregate has not been used to finance investment. That is changing. So, of course, as the, as the uh, crisis uh, hit, and what you see, sorry that you don't have the colors, is that actually savings is go the low, going, uh, low um, trending line is declined, has declined. Investment also declined, but not as much. And as a result, current account deficits have emerged. Now, there is not too much saving. Uh, foreign financing, though, as you see in the lower end, these are the, these are the bars, uh, um, FDI and other capital flows. As a result, there has been a massive drawdown of reserves. So, um, before the global financial crisis, no use of foreign savings for investment. It was used, you know, at the aggregate, build up reserves, which was properly necessary. But then now that with the crisis, actually the funding just as, just as to, to, uh, to emerging Europe, the funding, uh, foreign funding has dried up. Um, there is now a major current account balance and, and not enough financing, uh, current account imbalance and not enough financing around to, to, to use that. So, so that's, the, that's the idea. Um, the proposition would be that financial integration, when it comes around, actually could build in on drawing in foreign savings to finance investment, just as in emerging Europe. Now, not going through more details, more details on the, uh, the uh, specific, specificities of the, uh, of the southern Mediterranean countries uh, and differences within each Europe, um, just to highlight, because it's been uh, beautifully presented by, by other speakers, um, of course, the share of foreign-owned banks are very low, which means that, of course, with no uh, uh, major um, you know, foreign ownership and, and inflow of capital, as I showed, there is also no major inflow of, of know-how, uh, knowledge transfer that, that was so helpful in the case of, of emerging Europe. Um, it has been also discussed here that, that the banking sectors are really very large. I have some charts there, but you, you know that, of course. And financial integration, as, as highlighted by Daniela and others, actually is very high. But, but financial penetration, by any measure, is extremely low. So as and we have some nice charts here, if you're interested. But the bottom line is, 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 is the following that we have, as we established earlier uh, during the first panel, that there is this dualist financial system when, when there, are, there is a large banking sector that finances large corporates, large uh, ticket items. Then there is, at the same time, a relatively unregulated, therefore, uh, healthy growing microfinance sector, but there is no middle. No SMEs. Um, SMEs are cut off uh, from finance. And, and if we compare, we compare with, our, with our other countries, the, the share of small enterprises with credit lines is appallingly, appallingly uh, small indeed in the in the region. So, what could uh, financial integration really um, bring uh, to uh, to southern uh, southern uh, eastern eastern Mediterranean? Um, if, if the policy decision making was there to really open up uh, the sectors. Uh, opening up, first let me talk about the north um, uh, and, 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 and the south one. Opening up to, to competition, more competition, uh, to, to foreign capital and, and foreign banks, um, in our read, would be very helpful uh, with knowledge transfer, would be very helpful to have economic restructuring, introduce also an arm's length approach to enterprises. Um, that is a major lesson from emerging Europe and a major benefit of, of foreign banks. They were less politically influenced than the domestic banks when it came to, uh, to allocating credit. And that really what enhanced their, their, their productivity and profitability. That would really bring, I think, um, uh, something um, important uh, to the region. For that, of course, policy um, um, decision making has to be allowing uh, this uh, increased uh, competition. 
And in a sense, financial integration could be really used to address some of the 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 the, um, the, the, the problem of what is some called you know the privileged economy, the, the missing uh, uh, middle uh, middle class, and the weak dynamics between uh, uh, firms and, and and banks. Finally, a word, perhaps, Mr. Chair, and with that I would uh, finish on intra-regional financial integration. Because we just, I just spoke about you know, the foreign, sort of outside capital, not within the region. Um, the experience, I hope it will be not too um, disheartening, the experience in emerging Europe has been the following. First, the first arrow of integration has been very clearly toward more advanced economies and again utilizing um, uh, foreign capital and knowledge. And only when countries uh, has, have, start, have really built up a certain solid economic structure and trade structure, they started to trade among themselves. And this has happened even though within the EU the single market already existed at least in terms of traded goods and also in the financial sector. So even though there were no regulatory barriers, there were no um, custom uh, uh, union barriers, countries within the same uh, EU started to trade with themselves and started to do FDI within themselves um, only a certain amount of time. So I think there is some, you know, natural growing uh, uh, period when, when you have to establish your own strong economic base so as to you can, you can, you can do the South, uh, South trading and financial, uh, financial integration. However, when it starts, it really accelerates. So we saw that back even in the early 2000s, well into transition, you know, the linkages between Poland, Hungary, the Visegrad countries were more advanced, uh, let alone the, the, the previous uh, Yugoslav countries which had had a, a civil war among themselves. The relationship were, trade relationship was close to zero. In a matter of 10 years, it went up to 20-25%. So even within the, the former, um, uh, you know, political enemies and, and military enemies of, of, of Serbia and, 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 and neighboring countries. So uh, maybe there is a gestation period, a period for countries to rebuild themselves, uh, link up the uh, linkage, and then when it happens and, and there are no real legal barriers, it really can, can add to growth and, 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 uh, and uh, social welfare. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you.